Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thanks so much for coming back to Remy Be Real. I'm Remy, hope you're doing fantastic whenever and wherever you're tuning in. We're gonna get right into it. We are back with Adjust, Adapt, Achieve. This time we've got Jane Springston here with us. She is a fantastic runner, a mother of three. You've seen her wonderful, informative YouTube channel. You may have seen her on Instagram. Today, we get to chat about her progression from a nearly five-hour marathoner to qualifying for Boston and the progression she's made in between. With no further ado, let's get into it and hear from Jane. Hey guys, I'm Jane, an RRCA certified running coach. I've run seven marathons, including two Boston qualifying times. And I can tell you from experience that one of the hardest things to get right in the marathon is the pacing. And that's because we as humans just naturally want to go out way too fast when we're racing, we're excited and we're ready to go. And we think that that if we go as fast as we can at the beginning, then whatever happens at the end of the race won't matter because we'll have banked all of the time at the beginning when that's actually one of the absolute worst things that you can do. So Finally, we've got Jane here with us taking what sounds like is going to be a victory lap running your very first Boston Marathon. Jane, how are you feeling today? Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, I'm definitely feeling excited. We are less than two weeks away now from the Boston Marathon. Um, so yeah, definitely a victory lap. I was supposed to run it in 2020 and obviously we know what happened there. So uh, it's definitely felt like a long time coming at this point. So very exciting. And was there any rhyme or reason to, you know, uh, choosing to come to the April running and not the October running? Yeah, a really good question. I didn't get in for the <laughs> October um, one. So my qualification time was just over four minutes under the cutoff uh, in 2020. So that was enough to get me in at that point in time. And then obviously the next running the Boston Marathon was in October. And I don't even remember when, when the requirements were put out or whatever, but um, you had to be like nearly eight minutes under to get in for October of 2021. So my time was not good enough to get in, which meant that for some people, they didn't need to requalify, but I needed to requalify mm -hmm. for this one coming up. My time that I had from 2018 wasn't going to be good enough. So I had enough foresight to know that my time, you know, might not be good enough at that point. So I did run another marathon last summer that is what the time I use to get in this, this go around. So what did you go and what did you do? Qualifiers. Uh, so the marathon that I qualified in June was just like this pop-up revel race in Sun Valley, Idaho. So I was supposed to run the Colorado marathon in May. That was going to be my, you know, next attempt at qualifying. Mm -hmm. So I started training for that in January of 2021. Mm -hmm. And that one got canceled pretty good enough in advance where I was able to pivot. Um, it wasn't like I was super close or anything. Um, but at that point in time, I needed to find something basically between May and whenever I thought that they might give out, you know, when you had to register right. for, mm -hmm. for the next Boston Marathon, which is typically September, I want to say. Um, so basically something between May, which what I what I was going to be ready for and September. And there's just not a lot of options in general in the summer and especially during COVID, right? So uh, that's one I found available. Uh, my husband and I took a road trip to Sun Valley, Idaho and ran it and requalified. So I got to imagine that that is 100% a business trip. Nothing against the fine state of Idaho, but if you're coming out, summering in Idaho doesn't sound like exactly the prime vacation destination. So you came in with a plan, you got to business and you got it done. Yeah, absolutely. Although Sun Valley, which I was not familiar with whatsoever, I just was like wanted to race, um, is beautiful. In fact, it's uh, a mountain town that I guess a lot of um, like 
techies from California um, vacation to and actors and things like that. Uh, just wow, because it's foot and of, mouth. Look at that. It is a vacation know, spot. <laughs> area. It really is. Yeah. Uh, so some of the homes that you could see along course, I mean, you weren't right in it, but insane, ginormous mansions uh, that, you know, all of these very wealthy people vacation kind of in this little hidden spot. And it is hidden, right? Because you didn't know about it. I didn't know about it. And yeah, it's just sort of this sleepy little mountain town. So it was actually really, really cool. And maybe they want to keep it that way. So we'll, we'll yeah. we won't plug it too much. Yeah. yeah. Now yeah. let's take a step back and assuming that most people who are listening, who are watching, are pretty familiar with the qualifying standards, but for anybody who doesn't know, can you speak to what the Boston Marathon qualifying standards are and what they are for you? Yes, so I mean, they're, they vary depending on your age and gender, basically. So for me, I am 42, um, not, not again saying that out loud, but um, so for well, me, we call that masters, right? Is that? Yeah, I'm a masters runner, there runner now, I guess. Um, and so I have, I had to qualify with a 340 in 2018 when I needed to get the qualification. Even though I was only 38 at the time, I wasn't going to be running the Boston Marathon um, until I was 40. I know that sounds. There was such a a, a big expansion of time, you know, and that's what's kind of weird about the qualifying um, standards and timeline. You really have to look closely at all of that and understand all of that. Um, and so I only needed to get a 340 at the time, although they did change the the times that year. So it had been 345, and then all of a sudden I'm like, ugh, now I have to get a 340. Um, and then even then, you know that just because it's a 340 doesn't mean that you actually get in. And right. every year it's different based on how many people qualify and register. And then, so you submit your time if you qualify. So again, for me, 340 for males my age, it's, I want to say it's like 20 or 30 minutes faster. Yeah, I think it's around 330, yep. Yeah, and I mean, the youngins the, in their 20s, uh, men have to go like, I don't know, I want to say 250. I don't know, I'm just throwing out times, but yeah, uh, they're all very different. I knew I needed to get like at least a few minutes under. So when I was going into the race, I'm like, okay, hey, 340 isn't going to be enough. Uh, and kind of like when I was coaching a, a couple runners this past year who wanted to try for a BQ, it's like, Okay, well, we're aiming for five minutes under the qualifying time because we kind of know, historically speaking, that getting the qualifying time isn't enough. And so right. that's really hard because you want to say, okay, well, you get this time, you definitely get in, and then you don't. I always equate the Boston Marathon and applying and getting in kind of like applying to Harvard, right? So you have the GPA, but it's not enough. You also need the extracurriculars and you need the recommendations and the references. So you see the time, you get out there and spoiler, you did it. You went to Idaho and smashed it. But let's let's talk about that buildup because, you know, I love how you casually say 340. That's no small feat. And, you know, going underneath that. So what did that training cycle look like to get you to run a sub 340 and confidently punch your ticket to Boston? Yeah, um, so just to kind of preface this with the fact that, like, um, it took me a really long time to get get there. So it wasn't like I was someone who was doing this on my first try or that I had all the pieces in place, you know, um, it, I basically started running like when I was 21 years old with my dad and started like doing races and stuff here and there. Um, and I did run a couple marathons very, I, I don't want to say poorly, but not even close to my potential. I just didn't really know what I was doing, honestly. And at the time, I, it was just more of a like, check this off the list type of thing. But it wasn't fun. It it was um, just not really, weren't really very good experiences for me. And so I just took a long time off. So when I came back to it, which was basically 10 years, having kids, um, 
raising babies. And then my husband and I were like, okay, we want to do one together. And that would be really fun. Um, and it wasn't until then that I really started like watching YouTube videos, listening to podcasts where I'm like, okay, I was just doing this wrong for a really long time, you know? Um, but let's just see what I can do this time around. Um, and that marathon 2017, I think it was, that's kind of when I was like, okay, maybe I can qualify. Maybe if I, you know, keep going and stay consistent and keep following this advice that the experts keep saying, I can get to this point. So some of those, those things were, um, like building up mileage safely. Like I realized at the time I wasn't running enough weekly mileage. That was a big one. Um, slowing down. Uh, that was a huge aha. Like, wow. <laughs> oh, you aren't supposed to run hard for every single run. Um, because like someone who, as someone who grew up playing a lot of competitive sports, in my mind, it's like, you go hard all the time. And when I go to Orange Theory to work out, they tell you like, go all out, you know? Um, and so from the training perspective of like building aerobic endurance, that's not how you're supposed to do it. So I'd say, uh, yeah, those two big things right there. Uh, if anyone else, you know, is on their way to wanting, wanting that, like those are the two biggest things I think I did. The slowing down is something that personally I am grappling with and I know plenty of others who grapple with that as well where you think you're slowing down and you're not even slowing down enough you're still not recovering I've been yeah pulling it back but ending up in that gray zone instead of a fully recovering zone and that has just stagnated the progress which is frustrating because you see some progress and then it's like, oh yeah, yeah, let's keep going. And the progress is addictive, but then you, or at least for me, start to forget what got you there. And then you start to chase, right. chase more. This is a process that's been 20 years in the making. There are so many folks who come in, start running, hear about this, run a marathon, and like, oh boy, well, yeah, let's go do it. And love to hear it from those who are gifted, who have that engine, who can just get going and do it. But for the majority of us, this is going to be a process. So it is a breath of fresh air to hear that, yes, you're celebrating this, but this didn't come, you know, in a year or two. This has been... A, a process that's taken some time and you've been patient with it. Uh, so hats off to that. Thanks. Yeah, ab absolutely. You hit the nail on the head. I think, um, you know, had I kind of had a coach or just guide or paid attention more earlier on, it could have happened sooner. But at the same time, I, I don't like regret the history of it or how it came to be. It just kind of is what it is. And I took a lot of time in my life too to like focus on obviously, you know, growing a family and that type of thing. And so I think the cool thing about that too is, is coming back to it also um, and realizing too, like before I had kids, I'm like, hey, this is it. I'll never be faster than I am right now. <laughs> it's like that couldn't have been further from the truth, you know? So I think we get these and same, like I went through this too in the last few years, like, okay, I'm 40 now, like I'm getting old, like, you know, my fastest years are behind me. And it's like, all of that is, I mean, yeah, obviously some of that's true, but like at some point it will be like, that's a, a mentality shift. Um, and so uh, I, I think that that was something that was holding me back a, for a long time too. I think, like I said, going back to that year in, I ran like a 348 in 2017, I think it was. And okay, like, that was a confidence builder when it's like, mm -hmm. you know, just this mindset of like, I can do it, you know, and believing that you actually can, because before that I was like, I will never qualify for Boston. And I know there's going to be people watching this that are like, nope, that won't be me either. When it's like, you don't know that, you know, you, you, until you like really put in all the work that takes to get there, uh, you know, um, 
you know, I think a lot more people are capable than than they realize. Oh, so for if, sure. If they want it, you know. But part of that, and again, speaking for myself, is separating where you used to be from where you are now and where you can be. And I am in a bit of a valley, being transparent, where, hey, I was here and I was flying high, baby. Mm -hmm. But uh, going into 2019, uh, we had our son, our second child, and, you know, family's getting a little bit bigger. We need all hands on deck. Yeah. So everything kind of took a slide. And I thought that, all right, that's fine, because 2020, I'm going to come roaring right back. It's like, and then, you know, coming back and, you know, priorities were completely different. And then just looking at that former version of self as, wow, you were really, ah, uh, you, you, when you were in it, you didn't value it. And now that it's gone, I'm do trying desperately to recapture it. Exactly, and yeah. some of that is let it go. You were there. That's awesome. Look, you took the pictures. You have the medals. That's awesome. But let's move forward and see how much more there is to build. Right. Which I think is fascinating if we can transition to Jane as the coach. How did you decide that uh, helping others was something that was important to you? So, I mean, I think this kind of goes back to my former profession, which was a teacher, um, an elementary school teacher. I was for 12 years. Um, and I transitioned to working for myself and from home even before 2020 and everyone else started working from home. But, um, and I basically did a complete career shift um, into freelance writing and which is what I do now, um, content writing for the web. Um, but I, in the meantime, when I started freelance writing, I wanted to start my own blog and looked a lot into the fact of being able to create a business, um, you know, starting with a blog and make money that way. And so I was just looking for options of things that I could do at home while raising my kids, basically being a stay at home mom, but I also wanted to work. So that was just a lot of me being resourceful about what my options were. Um, so when I'm starting this blog and wanting to transition a career to writing, I am have to be like, okay, well, what am I interested in? I mean, what do I want to write about? Uh, what's my niche going to be? So, which came down to like, okay, I'm a runner. I know a lot about running. So that's what this is going to be about. So that's how it started. I mean, my teaching background is what ultimately got me into wanting to coach, uh, in, in, you know, have the capacity of continuing to teach um, in that way, but also the writing a, about running and helping others is kind of, a, you know, that transition as well. So a lot of it, going back to kind of what I said, those two marathons that I ran in my twenties that were really honestly, these pretty terrible experiences. <laughs> I mean, after the second one, I'm like, what am I doing? This is not even right. fun. Uh, and because of that, I just don't want other people to go through that same experience that I did. So being able to provide content via YouTube in form in the form of like these instructional type videos, longer, longer form content than, you know, what you might see on like in Instagram or something like that. Um, you know, that's kind of where I transition my, my teaching skills into being able to do that to YouTube. And then from there, okay, well, I have this blog and I have this YouTube channel where I'm, you know, teaching, coaching essentially. Um, and I want to be, you know, actually coaching and working one-on-one -on -one with runners or in groups or that type of thing. So, so you took it from the comment section to one-on-one -on -one instruction and here you are now. Yeah. Yeah. Which actually before I had, I was coaching before I started my YouTube channel, but the YouTube channel was a really an avenue to, to reach more people, um, and be able to, 
to coach those who, you know, aren't in a position to hire a coach right now. Or, you know, I, I get free content all the time, you know, to teach myself mm -hmm. things, right? So missing what I loved to do in the classroom, which is obviously very different with like yep. seven, eight year olds. Um, but in a way it's, it's the same. Like when you're in a classroom. Runners aren't too different from seven, eight year olds, as it turns out. <laughs> yeah. Every student is different. It's honestly true. Everyone has different needs. Everyone has different challenges. And that's what I found as a coach. It's like you realize how individual and unique everyone is in what they need help with um, and what their, you know, strong suits are and that type of thing. So, so yeah, Wonderful. that's kind of where I'm at. Well, so in, if this is where you're at, let's take another step backwards because I, j like, just this morning found out, did you know, guys, Jane was a competitive swimmer? <laughs> yeah. So um, let's talk about the sporting background and the transition that you made from there to focusing on running. So, yes, competitive swimming through high school. I, I didn't do any sports uh, other than like intramurals and stuff in college. And so I think that that's where the need for something new really came along um, because I played softball competitively, soccer competitively and competitive swimming. So clearly I was, you know, a lot of my time outside of school and schoolwork uh, was spent playing sports. Um, and just always have this drive, this competitive drive to, um, yeah, to race, compete, that type of thing. And especially in terms of swimming, it's it's you against you. I mean, yeah, okay, it's you against other people, but you know, you're always There's always striving. the clock though, right? Yeah, and striving to, to PR, get better at your own times. And really for me, um, yeah, I liked getting, getting the ribbons or winning or that type of thing, but I was never the best on the team or anything. So it wasn't like I was gonna, uh, you know, win first place or whatever. So in the end it was came down to, I want to do better than I did last time. Um, and being competitive with myself as well. So in college later on, my dad started, you know, racing a little bit and he had run like quite a bit in his younger years when I was a kid. So I think he wanted to like get back to that. So he had asked me if I wanted to do, I think the Boulder Boulder, which is a huge race here in Colorado, if you aren't familiar, um, but it's a 10 K. And so I was studying abroad in Europe and then he said, okay, I want to do this race. And so I'm like running by myself when I'm in, uh, in Wales studying abroad and like, Totally, I totally remember those first moments of like gasping for breath when you're like <laughs> just getting started with running and how terrible it is and who would ever do this, you know? Um, and yeah, came back and ran it. And that was kind of like the catalyst, I would say, because then after that, he that was kind of our thing. Like we uh, did races together. So that, that's, that, that was the transition there. Wow, that is so cool. And, you know, I... I, I'm sure you see it, but this kind of generational where, you know, your dad was running and maybe you weren't paying much attention to it as a kid. As you grow up, though, you just knew that that was something he did. And right. then he picks it back up later in life. And then here you are, you joined him, then you start running, put it down for a little bit. Your kids were watching, though. You pick it back up later in life. And maybe they'll come out there and start, you know, coming out there with you. Do you have plans for the Boulder Boulder when they're of age? Um, I mean, we'll see. It's it's funny because I, they're the same as I remember being when I was a kid. Like, I run around the block with my dad and I'm like, who would do this? This is terrible, you know? Like, I loved sports and obviously... <laughs> it's so different. Like when you're playing soccer, it's a really tough sport and you need a lot of endurance for it. And there were those moments when you're yeah, gasping for breath, but you're also like, I'll keep going because this is fun and it's for my team. And, you know, whereas it was kind of like, why would you put yourself through this? You know? Um, 
but yeah, my kids are like that now. Like they, they go running with me, especially like during lockdown, that was a big thing that we did together, which was actually really cool. And my son was super into it for a while, uh, would go run like a 5k with me and stuff. Um, but that lasted only for a little while. And then it was kind of like moving on to other things, but yeah, I, I, I think that's actually really normal though. You know, kids, kids love to let us just run around and have fun. They don't want to be like forced to <laughs> run a certain amount of miles or something like that. I mean, obviously they're not all kids are like that, but mine are not super into running right now, but they come to many of my races and cheer me on. And I think more than anything, whether it's running or whatever sport it is that they want to do, um, growing up or just, you know, just health and wellness in, in, as they age and aren't playing, you know, competitive sports with on teams or anything, uh, just, just showing them, you know, what is possible and what you can continue to do as you get older and compete and work for a goal. And, uh, really it's, it's more than that, uh, more that I just want to show them that, um, for sure. For Motion them. is medicine. Um, and, there's no better way than just getting out and moving. And as you say, it's not really important which sport it is, mm -hmm. as long as they get out there, find something that they like, something that gives you that outlet to move your body, clear your mind, and stay well. Yeah. With that, uh, the elephant in the room, uh, the question that I've been dying to ask you all morning, how tri curious are you? Because you've got the strong swim background. Clearly, you can run. I so, mean. okay. So, um, when I, when my husband and I first were engaged, got married, we lived in this condo, and it's right on this really long paved trail that we have where I live. Uh, I, I got a bike and I said, I'm going to run a triathlon. <laughs> so this is like when I'm 25 or sorry, not do, run a triathlon, do a triathlon. Uh, this is when I'm like 25. So I get a road bike. I mean, probably spent way too much money on it and started that, going. That tracks, that cycling. Yep. Yeah. And swim more and running. And then I honestly don't know what happened, but I got overwhelmed with it. And I, that was it. Like, and I didn't ride my bike much after that. And then recently, one of the athletes that I coach who just, it, this is something that I didn't even kind of think about, though I should have been a teacher, is just like how much my athletes inspire me, you know? And that was the same, you know, with my students and that type of thing. And um, so just in talking with one of my athletes, like when a coaching session, I'm coaching him, but then I said at the end of our coaching session like well, so do you have any questions for me like thinking it's gonna be about him you know um and he said yeah when are you gonna do a triathlon like I feel like you should do one because you're a runner is what you're saying you're a runner you're obviously a swimmer or in the past so when are you gonna do one <laughs> like uh it wasn't uh, are you going to do one like you need to do one uh and so then it just caught me off guard like you're right I, I probably should and you know yeah like this so the bike I mean, I can ride a bike. I'm not good at riding the bike. Uh, there's been times like in Orange Theory where I maybe are, am going through a, some sort of minor injury that I can't run on a treadmill, so I'll get on the bike. Mm -hmm. uh, and But it's just not like natural to me. And then also I'm very fearful of like, it, not the trail, because that, that's why in the, originally with the triathlon, I'm like, I can do this because I live on the trail. Like, I don't want to ride on a busy street on the shoulder. Like, that's scary to me. Uh, sure. So I think, you know, that's what it would come down to. And also, yeah, going back to like what you said about the cost, it's like, okay, I already spent a lot of too much money, like on my running and here's another sport to add in. Um, I have like a, a friend who's starting to do triathlons and I see her kind of. <clears throat> some things that she's new gear, what she's getting. And I'm like, oh my gosh, then I have to get all that. And, but yeah, I think as, as I kind of, I don't want to say, well, yeah, I don't know, hit my peak with marathons. I mean, or running or whatever, what's next. I start to think about that. Like, do I want to start doing trail ultras, you know, with running, uh, mm -hmm. do I want to try triathlon and, uh, 
so yeah, I guess that's where I'm at. I am curious. Uh, I think it would be cool to just, just see what it's like. A couple of nuggets for you. Uh, one, you don't have to fully transition and upend your life and become a triathlete to compete in a triathlon. You can borrow a bike, talk to a friend who's got similar build, and you should be a-okay. Mm -hmm. And indoor training exists, and it's not exactly the same, but even getting that fitness, there is some translation to the fitness you already have as a runner that will transition into cycling. And really the last thing, it's such a blast that, you know, no, hearing about your background and that you liked all these other sports, it's an atmosphere like none other. Uh, bonus from the spectating standpoint, when your friends and family come, you know, unlike a marathon, right, where you are spread out over all this space. Right. The, you know, if they see you twice and it's like a journey, you know, talking about Boston or any other point to point race, trying to see someone more than once. Oh, man, you just oh, yeah. might miss it. At the yeah. California International Marathon in December, my friend's husband and my husband, they, yeah, we saw them, I think, four times. But it was like they were booking it from, you know, each point to like be able to see us. So, so what you're saying about the triathlon, because you kind of keep coming back to. Exactly. You keep coming back to the transition area. Yeah. And in a lot of, you know, local races or, you know, even some of the uh, Ironman races, you'll do double loops. So, yeah, you come out, you go off to swim, say bye, but then you come back and hey, here's everybody. You go off on your bike and loop twice. Hey, here, there, there you go again. And then come back again, back in transition. Hey, how you doing? All right, yeah. off to my run. And yeah. then second loop. Hey, looking strong. Keep going. And then finish again. So it's like just such a vibe and you know i think at any of these events it's such a, a testament to what humans are capable of and i feel personally uh the nature of having three disciplines takes that to a next level it's like whoa hold on you're you're running after you just like i would have been done and i'm still pretty much done after the swim but then you got on your bike and you crushed that and didn't take a nap? Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> this is great. Um, so I, I, I'm right there with your athlete. Highly encourage you to try it out. Um, some of these things and one of the focuses that I like to share is how this sport can become more approachable and done on a budget. Because not everyone needs the fanciest gear. You know, like, yes, the lightest, fastest, latest carbon bikes are out there. Is that a requirement to get into the sport? No. Just like I'm sure you would tell someone who was trying to get into running, mm -hmm. yes, these $250, $280 shoes exist. Do yeah. you need that to yeah. get into running and have a good time? Yeah. No. You also don't have to go for a marathon right away either. Right. Plenty of fun to be had with a 5K, with a 10K, a half marathon. Not everyone needs to run a marathon. Not everyone needs to go out for an Ironman. So take a look at your local sprint. Take a I look will. at, you know. So I think kind of like with having those different disciplines too, uh, you know, as like, as I'm getting older and it just gets harder to recover, you know, as mm -hmm. you age. And so it's so important to have enough recovery time. And when you have those different disciplines and to be able to go for a swim and continue to build your aerobic endurance by cycling or swimming, you know, I think just gives you that longevity of being able to, to compete. And um, I, I honestly don't know tons about it, but I, I know that ultra runners are typically older. And I think that that's just because, you know, you're transitioning from, okay, all of your best times are behind you on the road and you can't recover like you used to. And so let's get out of the trails and just, you know, enjoy being in nature and that mental well-being, as well as still being able to compete, but on a different surface and you don't have to go as fast and that type of thing. So I think triathlon can be a really good, you know, transition too, in terms of like, 
aging and that type of thing. And so I, I thought about that too, like getting a, getting a bike at home as opposed to just having a treadmill, just because I have something else to utilize, um, maybe on days where recovery days aren't coming as easily, that type of thing. So honestly, I, I'm not there yet. <laughs> like, I feel like I've, I've created a, a good training plan for me that still allows me to get pretty high mileage and still feel really, really good. And that's kind of what I was sharing with you. Like I didn't miss a day this entire training cycle for Boston and I didn't get injured like I was a year ago. Um, oh, before hey, Sunday. let's knock on all the wood um, right now. Yeah. You still come on. Well, no, but I mean, okay, well, some fluke thing could happen at this point, but I mean, I'm at the point in my taper where it's like, I'm not adding on mileage, I'm taking it down, right? So I'm in a really good spot. But um, yeah, I think I think it's kind of shows too how important all of that recovery is that I've been able to, and easy mileage like we talked about is allowing me to continue to keep building up mileage. Uh, but I do think adding in some of those other disciplines will be helpful in the future. Jane, where can we find you where can the folks hear more about your, see more of your videos, get into your blog and maybe pick your brain about some coaching? Yeah, so my YouTube channel is Running With Jane. My Instagram handle is Running With Jane. Uh, so I do videos on my YouTube channel, uh, usually once a week, every now and then I'll do um, them a little bit more often, but they're pretty instructional in nature in terms of learning about how to, to train appropriately, often for marathons, but sometimes just running in general. And my blog is readysetmarathon.com. And that's where I also have a coaching page, but you can link to it from the, um, like the header of my YouTube channel as well. It's all right there. So I'll, so. I'll make sure to, by, so. right on. I'll definitely leave all of that information in the description will link to your latest video at the end of this one. Jane, I will definitely be out there cheering and looking for you at mile 26.1. That's okay, my spot. Okay. I will be that guy screaming. <laughs> Have so much fun. Thank You've you got I some packing to do. Thrilled. I do. I do. All right. All well, right. thanks for taking the time and hanging out with us. It's been a pleasure, Jane. Till next time. It's been real. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it.